Well, what is the right response to Christmas? Just think about that. What is a Christian response to Christmas? Uh, in the seventh century BC, Isaiah actually told King Ahaz that God is gonna give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and she will give birth to a son. Uh, seventh century BC, King Ahaz is starting to doubt whether God is really trustworthy, doubt whether God is really powerful. Um, it's not looking good. And Isaiah comes to King Ahaz and he says this, let me just put it up on the screen. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. Now, when was that sign fulfilled? At Christmas time in the Lord Jesus Christ, wasn't it? So the Christmas story about the virgin birth is not just a nice story. It's actually a sign from God teaching us deep truths about himself. He's teaching us through this sign that he is trustworthy and he is powerful to save. So how should we respond? What is the right thing to do in response to this sign? I know Christmas, the virgin birth, is one of the amazing things in the history of the world. And so what have we all done? We've decided there's going to be a special day, we call it Christmas, where we all come together and we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now, uh, the way we normally do that is we try and fit in church early in the morning and then we all rush off to have lunch with family and friends and we give one another presents. None of this is in the Bible. <laughs> is this actually what God wants us to do in response to Christmas or is there perhaps something more? You know, uh, I know some Christians these days who are not celebrating Christmas because it's become so commercialized, they think it's lost its spiritual value. And they do that in faith and intentionally. Uh, I also shared with you last week that it's very unlikely that Jesus' birth happened on the 25th of December. <laughs> so what are we doing on the 25th of December? Does God really want from us kind of a hurried church service in the morning, a few Christmas carols, and then just lunch with family and friends? Or is there something more that we're meant to learn from the sign of the virgin birth? Uh, today, as Christmas draws near, it's only two days away, and I know we're all a million things going on in our head. I want us to actually look at how both Mary and Zachariah respond to the virgin birth. There's actually a parallelism in the stories of Mary and Zechariah, and I don't think it's a coincidence. Let me just share a little bit of it with you. Zechariah is told, you're going to give birth to a son in your old age. And you know how he responds? He goes, how can I be sure of this since I am an old man? And then God turns up and says to Mary, you're going to give birth to a son even though you're not married. And she goes, how can I be sure of this since I am still a virgin? Similar questions, aren't they? But both Mary and Zechariah, after having their encounter with God, come out the other side doing pretty much the exact same thing, and it's actually beautiful. They both come out with faith, expressing itself in action. They both come out in worship of God, and both of them begin to do what I would call evangelism. So in response to Christmas, they come out with faith in action, they come out with real worship from the heart, and they actually begin to do evangelism. Um, the parallels in the story between Zechariah and Mary makes, makes me believe that maybe they are being examples for us of what a response to the virgin birth should look like. Has God actually lifted them up and gone, look guys at how these two are responding to news of the virgin birth. You see, to start with, both Mary and Zechariah respond to this news with incredible faith. I want you to have a look with me at Mary. I'm going to read from one verse earlier than Ben did. So let's just look at this amazing faith. I'm going to read from chapter 1, verse 38. Look at verse 38 if you've got your Bible in front of you. Luke 1, 38. Mary says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. 
May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Uh, a couple of verses before this, we've been told that Mary and Elizabeth are actually relatives. They're related. We're just told in verse 35. They're related, Mary and Elizabeth. Uh, we're also told in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, that Elizabeth and Zechariah come from the priestly tribe of Levi. Zechariah is a priest in the temple. And so if Mary is related to Zechariah and Elizabeth, she is most probably from the tribe of Levi as well. Uh, last week I shared with you that Jesus' royal descent from King David through the line of Judah actually came from Joseph. It was Joseph who was a descendant of King David. But now there's this relationship between Mary and Elizabeth leads us to believe that Mary was probably from the tribe of Levi. But this shouldn't surprise us. Zechariah, who we just read a little while ago, Zechariah actually gave a prophecy in the Old Testament, 500 BC. And he said, when the Messiah is born, his name is going to be Yeshua. 500 BC, 500 years before he was born, Zechariah said, when the Messiah is born, his name is going to be Yeshua or Yoshua, which is translated into Jesus, isn't it? And in that prophecy, you know what he says? He says the Messiah is going to be from the priestly line, but he's going to wear the, king, the, the, the crown of King David. Zechariah says the Messiah is going to be priest and king. And as we look at Luke, we kind of hear Joseph is from the descendants of David, but Mary is from the descendants of Levi, the priests. And somehow in Jesus, what does he become? our perfect king and our perfect high priest. <laughs> and there's actually reason to believe that is actually the heritage that he had. But what I really want you to notice in this story is Mary's response to what God told her. Imagine this, imagine this, you're a virgin, okay? You're a young girl, a teenager. God turns up and says, listen, you're a virgin, but you're about to give birth to a baby. Uh, he's gonna be the king of all the world. And by the way, you're cousin Elizabeth, who's now like retirement age, she's pregnant, she's going to have a baby too. And Mary responds, look at verse 38, look at verse 38 again, um, look at how she responds, I am the Lord's servant, may it be to me as you have said. <laughs> may it be to me, as, that's incredible faith, she's going, I believe you, <laughs> you've told me something that's absolutely really hard to believe, but I'm the Lord's servant, may it be true even as you have said. This is faith. Remember back in Ahaz, what's the problem? He's not standing firm in his faith. God is giving us the virgin birth so that we will know that he is trustworthy. He told us 700 BC, I'm going to give you a baby born of a virgin. Then he delivers and gives us a baby born of the virgin. What should we do when God speaks? Trust him. Believe him. And so Mary actually acts in faith, the sort of faith that the virgin birth, the promise of the virgin birth should actually bring about. But what I want you to notice, it's not just verbal faith. It's not like she just says she believes. She actually says she believes and then the minute God goes, she starts packing her bags to go and visit Elizabeth. Friends, that's a 120 kilometer walk. There's no planes, there's no trains, there's no automobiles. The minute God finishes saying your, your auntie, who's like retirement, is having a baby, she's like, okay, I believe you, God, and she starts packing her bag to go and visit Elizabeth. There's no, she can't confirm this. There's no email in those days. There's no text messages. There's no postal service. It's not like she can drop Elizabeth a line and go, I heard uh, on the grapevine or from a little birdie that you might be pregnant, Elizabeth. Is that true? Oh, it is? Okay, I'll come and visit you. 
She hasn't got any of that. The minute God finishes telling her, your auntie's pregnant, packs her bags and starts going. This is the sort of faith that the Bible wants. It's not just faith on our lips. It's actually faith that expresses itself in action. In action. Uh, let me just show you the map from last week. We looked at this map last week. Um, Mary's living up there in the north in Nazareth. Okay, so northern Israel. Jerusalem is down the bottom with the green circle. And we're told Elizabeth and Zechariah live in the hill country of Judah, which is to the west, kind of wrapping around there. We don't know exactly where, but that's kind of the hill country to the west of Jerusalem. And she's about to travel all that way. That's the normal route that you would take down along the Jordan Valley and then back up through Jericho to Jerusalem and out the other side to the foothills of Judah. 120 kilometers. And what's she going on? Simply God telling her her cousin is pregnant. Imagine how she was feeling as she was walking through Jerusalem, approaching the village in the foothills of Judah. What am I going to say when I get to the door? Uh, I'm just dropping in to say hello. You've got anything to share with me? What's she going to say? Well, imagine the doubts that would have been going through her head. I wonder if, oh, what if I'm wrong? What if I've just walked 120 kilometers for no reason at all? All sorts of doubts. But the minute she knocks on the door and she walks through the front door, her faith expressing itself in action is confirmed. What does Elizabeth say to her as soon as she walks through the door? Hey, you're pregnant, I'm pregnant. How cool is this? And there's a celebration. If she'd never walked there, she wouldn't have got that confirmation. But her faith, expressing itself in action, walks through the door and what does she discover? God is trustworthy. Just as he told me, it is exactly true. And so faith expressing itself in action actually confirms for us that God can be trusted. Every time you put your trust in God and actually step out in faith and do something, trusting what he says, guess what happens every single time? It works out okay because God is trustworthy. And as you step out in faith and get that confirmation, it becomes easier and easier to step out in faith because you learn over and over again that, hey, God is trustworthy. He keeps his word. It is true. You hearing me? Friends, this time of year, Christmas time, People come out of the woodwork giving verbal faith in Jesus. You know, right now down in the domain in Sydney, there's going to be thousands of people gathering and they're all going to sing to their, sing out their hearts in excelsis Deo. What does in excelsis Deo mean? Glory to God in the highest. And all these people are going to be singing God's praise and yet the rest of the year there is no evidence that they have an interest in Jesus or an interest in God's word. Is there? It's lip service. It's going through the motions of saying something that you don't really believe. And many of those people who do the carols and everything will actually turn up in churches on Christmas Day because it's a nice tradition. They enjoy doing this and they might even say they believe in Jesus. But friends, real faith actually expresses itself in action. Real faith will actually listen to what God says and start putting it into practice because God is trustworthy. Uh, Jesus' own brother, James. So Jesus had a brother named James. He wrote one of the books in the Bible. And he tells us faith, when we just have verbal faith and we don't put it into action, it's not real Christian faith. It's not real Christian faith and you won't be saved. Those people who consider themselves Christmas and Easter Christians are not real Christians. Real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ should be evidenced in your life, not just once a year, but throughout the entire year. And so as we go into Christmas ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, is the faith that I'm declaring at Christmas time evidenced in my life, in my work, in everything else I do? Is there evidence that you're a Christian, apart from just the words that you say? Is it evidenced in your choices? Uh, this isn't just a challenge for Christmas and Easter Christians either. If, if there are people who, who think they're just Christmas and Easter Christians, I want to challenge you. 
You need to consider following Jesus throughout the year. But here's the challenge for all of us. Even if you consider yourself a real Christian, a born-again evangelical Christian, I want to ask, is your faith still being expressed in action? Right now, the world is putting massive pressure on Christians not to express our faith. You realise this? The world is trying to stop us expressing our faith in all sorts of contexts. They're quite happy for us to say we believe in Jesus if we just leave it at that. But the minute we want to start doing evangelism or we want to pray in certain situations or we want to share the gospel, no, they they don't want any of that. And so the world right now is putting pressure on the church just to be lip service Christians, not put anything into action. And I want to ask have you yourself sort of capitulated? Have we kind of gone quiet? Is our faith still actually being expressed as it should be in obedience to God? Or is the pressures of the world and the pressures at Christmas time actually blocking out what we should be doing? Um, We see a very similar model with Zechariah. Let me just tell you the story of Zechariah again. Zachariah, just like Mary, he has doubts when he's first told he's going to be a dad. He's like, really? (laughs) That has a consequence. What happens? He loses his ability to speak. Now, when you're a priest and you're meant to be declaring the praises of God, losing the ability to speak is pretty costly. You get the point? It's a bit hard to be a priest when you can't speak, isn't it? And so he's lost the ability to speak. But when the time comes and his child is born, his faith actually expresses itself in action. What did God tell him to name the child? John, what does all the family members want to name the child? Zachariah, that's the tradition. We name the children after their dads. That's what we do. That's the pressure of the world. And he goes, no, give me a tablet. God told me to name this child John, I trust in God, so what am I going to do? I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And in that very moment, as his faith expresses itself in action, his faith is confirmed because his tongue is loosed. (laughs) The rightness of his actions, the rightness of him trusting God and doing what God says is actually confirmed because God gives him back his ability to speak. Friends, Is our faith really being expressed in the way we live day to day? The virgin birth, the sign of Emmanuel, was given to us to convince us that God is trustworthy, that God is with us, and that God is powerful to save us in all circumstances. And so are we stepping out in faith? Are we expressing our faith in our entire life and everything we do? Let me just ask this. We say we believe in Jesus. We say we believe in God. Are you actually doing with your money what God tells you to do with your money? Are you doing that? Um, We say we believe in God. Are you actually serving with your gifts in God's kingdom as the Bible tells you to? Uh, Are you doing evangelism? Do you have a concern for the poor and needy like... You see, real faith in God actually expresses itself in how we live on a day-to-day basis. Mary had a faith that expressed itself in action. Zachariah has a faith that expresses itself in action. The virgin birth, they're going, okay, I believe God can do this. I believe nothing is impossible with God. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to live my whole life trusting in God. And that is the sort of faith that God wants from us in our entire lives. The second thing I want you to see is that Mary and Zechariah respond to the virgin birth in worship. Not just in faith, but in worship. Have a look with me at um, verse 46. Let's have a look at verse 46 at how they respond. Verse 46, just Mary to start with. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will be called me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. 
holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Um, on and on, down to verse 56. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. There's all this great praise and worship, and then we're told she stayed with Elizabeth for three months. Can anyone remember how pregnant was Elizabeth when God told Mary about it? Oh, that's right, six months, wasn't she? So six months, Elizabeth is already pregnant. Mary's told your auntie's pregnant. And so she ups and she goes down there for how long? Three months. So what happens at the nine month mark? Normally, a baby is born. So she's gone down there to help her auntie in the last three months of labor. And here's an amazing thought. There is a chance Mary may have even played midwife to Elizabeth and been the one who caught baby John as he came from the womb. Isn't that an amazing thought? We won't know the answer to that one until we get to heaven, but what I really want you to notice is that Mary, in light of the virgin birth and everything God has revealed to her, actually breaks into praise and worship. Um, this passage that we just looked at where she's doing the worship, in the history of the church, it's been called the Magnificat. I know it's a weird the Magnificat. It comes from the word magnify. If you look at verse 46 again, you'll see that it says, my soul glorifies the Lord. That word glorify is also magnify. Magnify is probably even better. And the word glorify or magnify means to lift up God's name on high, to make God look absolutely fantastic. And Mary is saying, my soul wants to make God look awesome because he has been so good to me. He's made me the mother of the Messiah of the world. Friends, this is worship. This is what Mary is doing. She's beginning to worship. Now, again, I'm not holding Mary up as some sort of saint that we should follow. Okay? Um, this passage itself, Mary says, I, I receive mercy. She said, God is my saviour as well in this very song. So I'm not holding up Mary as a saint to follow but in this particular passage, Luke, Mary and Zechariah are being held up as exemplars. They're kind of responding to the virgin birth in a way that is good and right. It is something we should emulate. And so I want to say to you, here's the truth. The one thing that God is really looking for from you in light of the virgin birth is faith in him and faith in his word. There's a saying among Christians, saying among Christians that's 100% true. Christians are saved by faith alone in Jesus, okay? Christians are saved by faith alone in Jesus. But you know what? Real faith doesn't stay alone for very long. We're saved alone by faith, but real faith doesn't stay alone for long because real faith begins to express itself in actions and obedience to God. And real faith begins to express itself in worship in worship. Friends, Mary worships God because he's done something for her that she knows she doesn't deserve. But God has sent Jesus into the world to save us even though we were sinners. Now, do we deserve that? Not at all. He's given us this incredible gift simply because he loves us and the right response is to thank him and praise him and worship him because there's nothing else we can do. Again, this time of year, there's lots of pretend worship going on down in the domain, isn't there? Oh, come all ye faithful and silent night. And we're singing all these great praises down there, but is it real worship? You see, real worship actually comes from the heart that knows it is a benefactor of the mercy of God. Real worship comes from the heart when you know you have received from God a blessing you do not deserve. You see, there's a difference between just singing about God and singing to God or for God. Okay? Real worship. What we see in this story is Mary worships personally because of what God has done for her, but Zechariah also worships corporately because of what God has done for the Jewish people in giving them a Messiah. So one speaks personally, the other one speaks corporately, but let's have a look at it. Have a look with me, Mary. Look again at what she says. 
And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. And he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. This is personal worship. It's actually coming from her heart. My soul, my this, my that, my saviour. God has blessed her and he has made her the mother of the Messiah of the world. And she can't believe it. She's like, I didn't deserve this. When she says God has been mindful of my humble state, when she says God has been mindful of my humble state, she's saying there's nothing in me that's worthy of this. I'm just an ordinary, humble Israelite. There's nothing good or special about me, but God in his mercy has chosen to give me this incredible privilege. And God, she says, is willing to give this privilege to everyone who fears him, mercy, giving us more than what we deserve. And so she is praising God, worshipping God. Again, this is the right response to God giving us something that we do not deserve. All you can do is say thank you. All you can do is praise him. All you can do is tell other people about how awesome God is. This is what he did for me. Challenge is, who have you done that with this Christmas? Have you, have you worshipped God? Who have you told other people about what God has done for you? Have a look with me at Zechariah again. Just turn over the page to Zechariah. Look at how Zechariah begins in verse 68. Um... And this is all in the us, it's not me, it's us this time. He says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Again, Zechariah is worshipping God because Israel, the Jews, have received the promised Messiah. They don't deserve him. They've been sinful. They've been doing all sorts of dumb things. But God, in his mercy, has provided them with the Saviour, the promised King, because of his mercy and because he has remembered the promises he made ages ago to the patriarchs. And Zechariah goes, I know what the right response is. In light of all God has done for the Jews, we should be worshipping him. Join with me in worshipping him. But friends, are we really worshipping God? Is it a priority in what we are doing? Um, we're going into Christmas. It's incredibly busy. Have you actually even had time to stop and thank God for what he has done for you in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you really praised him and worshipped him? It's easy for us to go through the motions and even sing a few carols with, oh Lord, I love you and you're awesome and I'm so glad you're in my life. The, the right response to God is to trust him and express that trust in action, but part of expressing that trust in action is to worship God, to praise him, to, to give him the glory that he deserves. I'm just asking you in the busyness of Christmas, whether it's with family around the tree or whether it's with lunch with friends, can you actually spend a little bit of time just worshipping God in prayer, in praise, in something? Because God has given us far more than we deserve in the Lord Jesus Christ. The last thing I want to share with you, though, and this is rather interesting, is not only do Mary and Zechariah express faith and they express worship, they actually begin to go into evangelism. Um, Mary and Zechariah actually start preaching the gospel and calling other people to respond to it as well. Have a look with me at Mary. Just look at how Mary goes on from verse uh, 50. Let's read from verse 50. Mary says, His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Um, what I want you to notice is that Mary's worship of God 
turns into personal testimony of what God has done for me, and then it actually moves to what God could do for you in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. His mercy extends, does Mary say his mercy just extends to me? No, she says his mercy extends to everyone who fears him. So she goes, this is who God is. This is what he's done for me. This is what he could do for you as well. But she says, if you want to receive mercy from God, this is what you need to do. You need to be humble, not proud. You notice she says this over and over again. What does he do to the proud? He brings them down. What does he do to those who truly approach God humbly? He lifts them up. And so she's explaining, I, I, I was humble. God gave me much more than I deserved. If you too are humble and you come before God, not thinking that you're awesome, not thinking that you deserve everything from him, but recognizing that you're a sinner, recognizing that you've made mistakes in life and acknowledging that you need God in your life, he will humbly, willingly begin to give you his blessing. And so Mary actually isn't just giving personal testimony, she's actually sharing the gospel and she's telling people how to receive the gospel by through humility, not through pride. And she says, this is open to everyone who's a descendant of Abraham, is what she's saying at this point. But Zechariah does something very similar. Um, I'm not going to read it all right now, you can have a read later, but you notice what Zechariah does. He, he says, he sets the virgin birth in the history of salvation. He goes, it's not just a nice story. It's not just even a sign. This is God's salvation come into the world because we're all sinners, he's saying. God has actually sent Jesus into this world and he says, I quote, he has sent Jesus so that we can serve God without fear all the days of our life in holiness and righteousness. He's actually explaining the whole purpose Jesus has come. And then he goes on and he talks about John the Baptist and he says, it's not all about my son. My son's just playing one small part in preparing the way for Jesus. He's come to declare to people they need forgiveness of sins. That's what we need before God. Forgiveness of sins. And we need to come out of the darkness. And we need to come out of the valley of the shadow of death and come into God's light and God's peace. Zechariah preaches all this in his song. He's calling people to believe. He's not just saying, I believe. He's saying, this is the true Messiah, the true Savior of the world. Come and put your trust in him for the forgiveness of sins as well. Friends, I just want to ask, is our gospel proclamation coming into Christmas 2018 as clear as it actually was at the very first Christmas with Mary and Zachariah? They're actually saying this is what the virgin birth is about. It's about trust in God, it's about true worship, and it's actually about salvation going out to the ends of the earth. It's not just about the Jews, it's not just about Mary, it's actually about people like you and I being saved for eternity from God's judgment. You see, we have a problem. We all actually have a problem with sin, which means that we actually face God's judgment. We face his wrath and damnation on the last day. We've all fallen short of God's standards. None of us are gonna be able to stand before God and go, I did everything right, I'm good enough to get into heaven. We've actually all fallen short. And the fact is what we deserve from God is only the fearful dread of wrath and damnation. That's what we deserve. But God in his great love for us asked Jesus to come into this world. And when Jesus went and died on the cross, he took the punishment for your sin. He actually died in your place. The consequences that should have fallen upon you fell upon Jesus as he died on the cross, which means you can now be spared. Now, if Jesus did that for you, what should you say to him? Thank you. Thank you. It's the only way to actually be saved. I know the world out there is telling you, don't worry, there's lots of ways to be saved. It doesn't really matter, but they're lying to you. If there was any other way to be saved than through the Lord Jesus Christ, God would never have asked his son to come into the world and go through all of that. The only reason he asked Jesus to do that was there was no other way for us to be saved where God maintained his justice and yet showed us mercy.
There was no other way. And so my question is, if you're here today and you're not yet a Christian, will you actually put your trust in Jesus today? The virgin birth is a sign from God that he is trustworthy, that he is powerful to help you, and he wants to be with us in our lives. Will you put your trust in him? A faith that actually will begin to change your life, a faith that will express itself in worship and hopefully in time, even in evangelism. But friends, if you're here today and you're already a Christian, you're already a Christian, you're about to go into Christmas, you're about, the chaos is about to begin over the next few days with all those things. And I want to ask you, in the midst of all that chaos, will your faith express itself in real action and obedience for God? Will you find time to truly worship God for what he has given you and done for you in the Lord Jesus Christ? And who over the next days can you actually share your testimony and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for, with? You know, Christmas is not just about a nice lunch with family and a few songs. Christmas is actually about the salvation of the world through the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, worship, and the salvation of souls. Should be that all through the year, shouldn't it? But especially, I think, at Christmas time. Let me pray. Let me pray. Dear Lord God, we do thank you for all that this season brings. Lord, we do thank you that we have holidays. We thank you that we have opportunity to catch up with family. We thank you that in this country we have access to all sorts of beautiful foods. But Lord, in our heart, here at the moment in church, we know that that is nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to what you have given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us who are sinners, that we, be, that we should be called your children, that we should be forgiven, that we should have our name written into heaven, all because of Jesus. Lord, all we can do today is say thank you, we love you, we want to worship you, but Father, we also want to say, take us and use us to share this news with other people. Lord, prepare hearts and minds for those we speak to that we might find fertile soil, that receptive minds to our testimony of how good you are and what you've done for us. Again, Lord, may we have courage to share the gospel this Christmas as you give us opportunity. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.